Morgan, and I'm the Director of Gallery and Exhibition Programs here at the Minneapolis College of Art and Design. And perhaps it goes without saying that it has been a supreme pleasure to be able to work with Will Steger on the exhibition Inside an Explorer's Mind. This is a show which is on view in our second floor concourse gallery space. And I would encourage you to visit the show if you haven't already. Because I think if you take the time to read and to listen and to look, there are multiple layers of extraordinary experiences, both related to polar explorations as well as to innovative design thinking. Uh, Jay Coogan, who is president of the Minneapolis College of Art and Design, conceived of the idea to feature Will Steger's design work in our college galleries. And Jay would have liked to have been here this evening, but unfortunately, he's out of town on MCAD business. Instead, I have the pleasure of welcoming you and to also introduce Eric Dayton, who was a member of Will Steger's Arctic Transect 2004 dog sled ex ex expedition. And he's going to formally introduce Will in just a couple minutes. But first, I would like to explain a little bit about the genesis of the exhibition and why I think it's such a wonderful fit for our art college. So last winter, Jay Coogan had the opportunity to take part in what appears to be an annual event at Will Steger's homestead outside of Ely, Minnesota. In the freezing cold of winter, which is indeed coming, um, blocks of ice are cut out of the homestead lake, they're loaded onto horse-drawn sleds, and they're placed in an ice house to provide food refrigeration for the upcoming year. I'm not sure exactly what kind of experience Jay had, what it did to him, but he returned to campus and immediately asked when we might be able to do an exhibition about Will Steger's design work. I did not know of Will Steger, the designer. I had only heard of Will Steger, the explorer. But quickly I've learned that this moniker is a very good fit. Will has designed clothing, watches, eyewear, and shoes for his expeditions, not to mention the dog sleds, the canoes, the harnesses, and packs. He's designed his homestead, which features a large array of buildings that are visually interesting, if not downright amazing, both inside and out. And indeed, they're made by hand. Everything is considered. Will's aesthetic sense is evident in how something looks and how something works. For these reasons and many more, this is a fabulous show to feature at an art and design college where design thinking is taught and applied on a daily basis. Students here are encouraged to be creative problem solvers, to work collaboratively on projects that need the hand and the head to work together in tandem. We learn to pay attention to the little things, the choice of color, font size, of utility. We ask questions, we innovate, and we dream. These are qualities that Will has exhibited his entire life, and these are qualities that we hope to inculcate in the students who choose to come to MCAD. Over the past four months, it has taken Will, three of his talented associates, John Ratzloff, Julie Restow, and Jerry Stenger, as well as my industrious staff of 10 MCAD students and alumni, thank you, to see this show become a reality in a very, very short time. I'm very appreciative to everybody who contributed to this endeavor. And now to get back on track, I will introduce you to Eric Dayton, who will provide a different perspective on the Will Steger you may know and have come here to learn about. So Eric Dayton is the co-creator and the co-owner of Askoff Finlayson, the bachelor farmer and the Marvel Bar in Minneapolis. His business partner and brother, Andrew Dayton, is an MCAD trustee, and I'm pleased that he's also here this evening. Eric was a member of the Arctic Transect 2004 dog sled ex exhibition, expedition, you can see what world I, I live in. And, um, it was, and this, this expedition was led by Will Steger. After three months of training at Will's homestead in Ely, a team of six people and 30 dogs spent six months traversing 2,000 miles of the Canadian Arctic. Their expedition was followed online by over 2 million K-12 through school children from around the world. Following the trip, Eric and Will met with members of Congress in Washington, D.C. to raise awareness about climate change. Eric was born and raised in Minneapolis. He's a graduate of Williams College and Stanford Business School. He's a member of NRDC's Midwest Council and a trustee of the Minneapolis Institute of Arts. Thank you, Eric, for being here this evening.
Thanks very much, Kerry. It's an honor to be here tonight to introduce Will Steger. I've known Will since I was 10 years old. Because of my father's long friendship with Will, I got to spend a lot of time around him when I was a young boy. I was just getting into camping myself and going on week-long summer trips in the Boundary Waters. So for a boy who likes camping, to have Will Steger stop by the house to spread out maps of Antarctica and show the route of an upcoming expedition, it was like having Michael Jordan come over to shoot hoops in the driveway. <laughs> Will has held many high-profile titles during his career. Explorer, teacher, author, photographer, and environmental advocate. But beneath the surface, he's also been a remarkable innovator, designer, and entrepreneur. Tonight, we're going to hear about the lesser-known side of his talents. I've spent much of this past week thinking about Will and his work as a designer. And I keep coming back to the idea of constraints. Working within constraints is often what breeds creativity and inspires great design. And no one has spent more time living and working within constraints than Will. Will is someone who cuts the handle off his toothbrush before an expedition to get rid of the extra weight. He doesn't bring books on expeditions because they're too heavy. And he doesn't even allow himself the luxury of a journal. Instead, he writes on the backside of the maps that he needs for the trip. And perhaps the best kept secret about Will is that I don't know anyone who gets cold more easily. <laughs> now you might ask, why would someone like that choose to be an Arctic explorer for a living? Only Will can answer that one. But he spent a lifetime having to figure out how to stay warm in the coldest, harshest places on Earth. That's creativity. Will has always worked within extreme constraints and yet has never been constrained by them. I don't know anyone who can accomplish more with less and what Will has accomplished in his career is staggering. A few highlights. The first, the first confirmed dog sled journey to the North Pole without resupply. The longest unsupported dog sled expedition in history, a south to north traverse of Greenland. The first crossing of Antarctica by dog sled, a historic seven month, 3,700 mile journey. Awards from the National Geographic Society, the Lindbergh Foundation, and the Explorers Club. And most recently, Will created the Will Steger Foundation. That resume places Will alongside names like Robert Perry, Roald Amundsen, Jacques Cousteau, and Amelia Earhart. And that's the company in which Will belongs. He's the greatest explorer of his generation and mine, and we may never see accomplishments like his in exploration again. I've learned so much from Will during the time I've gotten to spend with him. Will has taught me about hard work, about vision, about commitment, and about perseverance. He's one of the most inspiring people I know. And so it's a great honor tonight to introduce someone I've known as a friend, a mentor, and a leader for over 20 years, Will Steger. Yeah, thank, thank you, Eric, for the, all the great comments and for your friendship over the years. And uh, I want to thank everybody, all the great friends. This is a great moment for me. Um, many, of my, many of my former students are out there. Uh, I met a seventh grade student from back in 1967. Uh, current students I work with uh, this summer. Uh, it's a real homecoming of brothers and sisters and great friends in the audience. And um, I want to thank first, uh, Besides Eric, uh, Jay Coogan, who is unfortunately can't make it today, the president of the college here. Uh, Jay was responsible for getting the exhibition on board. Uh, Jay and I met two years ago when he first came to town on a snowy, cold December day in a, a little cafe there on Hennepin Avenue, and we hit it right off. And I invited him up to Ely, and as Kerry mentioned, and uh, from there we really became good friends. And that's, that's who, uh, that's who uh, Jay is. I mean, I noticed that with the students here, everybody... Jay's a very special person, and all the students are very special for him. We're very, very fortunate to have him here at the uh, college. Um, Terry Morgan, uh, just a wonderful woman to work with, uh, very professional, and her team, 10 people, tremendous long hours. We finally got everything up on Friday, Friday night here, and uh, I thought this was going to be a whole week of stress for myself, but they took it over and pretty much did everything. Uh, the staff here, uh, board of directors, I want to thank you, and um, I want to particularly thank John Ratzlaff. Is John in the audience, the photographer? Where is he? Okay. Yeah. 
I owe so much to John. The, the, all these photographs are his. And uh, he has a book uh, about the Wilderness Center on the back showing some of his pictures. And most of the pictures today are from John's. John selflessly has worked the last three years, always coming up to Ely. It actually took me a while. I, I don't normally allow people, photographers and stuff into my life, but it took him patiently two years, uh, and finally I accepted him. <laughs> and I said, well, come on up wherever you want to photograph. And we've become very good friends uh, since then. Uh, this is my first e exhibition, um, Inside an Explorer's Mind. Uh, I, I really wanted to get across what expeditions are about. Uh, you equate, most people are equated about hardships and all, all the hard stuff that you go through, but uh, that's just the veneer. It's really about the inspiration and, and what you learn along the way. Uh, and there isn't a better teaching environment than the polar and Arctic uh, areas. It's about survival, innovation, and design. Uh, it's particularly about the power of the wilderness. Uh, all my life I tried to, as much as possible to be in that space of creativity, in that space of inspiration. To achieve this, uh, ever since I was young, I sought out the wilderness. To live in the wilderness, to place my mind in the wilderness. I made my home there when I was young, 19 years old. I bought property from the far north. I explored its vast regions, uh, the rivers, the forests, the cold, and the ice has been my teacher over the last 50 years. My innovations and designs enable me to survive and flourish in these, these areas that are shunned by humankind. Uh, through mastery of skills uh, and living intuitively in the present moment led me to the exploration of mind. It was here that I discovered clarity of thought and inspiration that has guided my life and my vision and designs for the Steger Wilderness Center, which I'm going to introduce tonight. I only have one diagram here, but I thought, how do you describe your life? <laughs> and so <laughs> here it is. <laughs> It's a good, um, good exercise. I, I, would, I would suggest you all try that. So good friends came up with the wheel. And uh, basically, I have three legacies throughout my life. Uh, two of them you're very familiar with, my expeditions. Uh, expeditions are adventure. I mean, we all relate to adventure. I live in adventure. I dream of adventure. Adventure is almost everything for me sometimes. It's the expression of spirit. It's where you really get out of yourself and, and attach to that spirit. We attach to adventure. All of us were adventurous as young kids. And unfortunately, along the, the seriousness of growing up and all, all the problems, uh, we sometimes lose that spirit of adventure. But it's right around the corner. Walk around the park, walk around our lakes, canoeing up in the Bounty Waters. It's always there for us. Uh, the, the expeditions have been, of course, my source of inspiration, my vision. It's been an odyssey, a quest. You can relate to that. The 40 days in the desert, uh, it's this type of an experience where you get down to the very bottoms of what is life about? What is this little spark that we all have? What, what, what about it? What is it? Where does it go to? Does it last afterwards? These are things that you face on expeditions and through, through adventure. Uh, expeditions have also been a powerful vehicle for me, fortunately, to reach the public and to connect with uh, students. Through dog sled expeditions and that, um, I've interacted with tens and tens of millions of young people over, over the years. Uh, many of these people now are in their 30s and 40s, and I, I have to say I'm a very privileged person. The Will Steger Foundation uh, represents my lifelong commitment to education and environment. This is my vocation. It always has been my vocation ever since I can remember. I knew I would be a, a teacher, and I always had a deep concern for the environment. So I didn't have to question my route. Uh, my commitment to education and environment is my life is service. To me, service is everything. That's what we're here on this planet to do, is to serve. In Zen, in the native cultures, they talk about the warrior. The warrior is not about bows and arrows and guns and so forth. It's about service, doing service for humankind. My life was given a, a deeper purpose and drive as I began to see the impacts of climate change firsthand through my polar expeditions. The current, these concerns led me to form the Will Steger Foundation in 2006. Will Steger Foundation, uh, we work exclusively in climate, 
We work in uh, three areas, K-12 education curriculum, which includes uh, teacher, teacher training, teacher enhancement. Uh, our climate curriculum and energy curriculum now is in the state, uh, all around the state. Uh, this is something that I've worked with uh, almost 50 years now in education. I've never had my eye at, at all off the mark in education. Uh, if my profession is that basically program developing in education, I formed uh, many programs in the colleges around the state. I did the uh, Center for Environmental Education, Global Center for Environmental Education at, at Hamlin. I founded that in 89, 90. I came back to the city here in 06. They didn't even know I founded it, which is an ultimate compliment. Uh, today, there's about 70 graduates there. So I've, I've created things, and I normally, I'm the catalyst of change. And once it's going, I step out the back door and move on. But with the Will Steger Foundation, this is a, a big part of my legacy. I will work with uh, climate to my very end. I'm totally committed to this. I'm committed to the youth, because this is something that is going to be with us for the rest of our lives. And then um, the... Um, in my notes here. It's the first time I had long notes on a, on a project here. But then the um, center, Stigger Wilderness Center, all my life I've, I've had this vision of forming a center in the wilderness where I could bring about, bring together small groups of decision makers, small groups being six, seven, eight. Uh, this is the ultimate of interaction. You add more than eight, you, you lose uh, interaction. And I've seen over and over the power of the wilderness uh, and the effect, on, especially on small groups. When you empower seven people, eight people, when you're interacting around a common goal, yeah, it's really simply amazing what happens. And uh, I've quietly worked on this uh, the last 25 years, and uh, I'm launching this for the first time tonight. I want to talk a little bit about my humble beginnings here. Um, this is where I was raised, uh, 71st and Logan in um, Richfield. Ten brothers and sisters. Uh, the six boys lived on the top floor in one room. Uh, we, we had one bathroom. Uh, in the morning at school, we each had like an eight-minute shift. And um, it was actually training for expeditions, because uh, <laughs> uh, my last uh, 30 years, I've, I've worked with teams of six in really cramped quarters. And you, you, you really learn to cooperate in that. My dad fought in World War II in the South Pacific. Um, interesting, my, uh, he was on leave, uh, heading out, being shipped out. And so my mother took the train back in 43. I mean, for her mother to take a train to San Francisco was a big deal to meet my dad on leave. But they canceled the leave. My dad and two other guys uh, snuck underneath the fence. Uh, my dad was first. The other two guys got caught, and I was conceived. And, um, and then there was no certainty my dad was going to be, come back alive, so I was given his name, William. So he did fortunately come back. He raised uh, you know, a total of 10 kids. He raised uh, the family on his own ideas and his own inventions. He was an entrepreneur. Uh, I have everything to thank my parents for because they gave my brothers and sisters, uh, us all, uh, the freedom to do what we wanted. We had several rules. Uh, we had to maintain a certain grade point average, stay out of trouble with the law. And then if we wanted to do something, we had to pay for it ourselves, which was, to us, me, a big deal. And I, I was born with uh, a real vision for adventure, as I mentioned. Um, this first picture here is 16 years old in the Canadian Rockies here with, with hemp ropes that we bought in the local hardware store here in uh, say, uh, Richfield. Ever since a young kid, I mean, ever since I can remember, I was climbing trees, telephone poles, buildings, uh, I was always enthralled with heights and climbing. National Geographic really inspired me uh, many, in many different ways but in, in climbing. Uh, it's a real statement for my parents that a 16-year-old kid here is standing on a cliff. Uh, they were really worried about the climbing part of my, my career at that time, but they, they allowed me to do this. So my goal, what was going through my head here, was I wanted to be on major expeditions way in the mountaineering and, and climbing first ascents, placing camp after camp. That's where I was heading for here at age 16. Uh, and with that in mind, um, we did, uh, I always fascinated also with ropes and traverses, and uh, I was good at hooking in friends and brothers always to take, to <laughs> recruit them here. So we, were, we did these traverses. I, I, I learned out of a book. I checked a book out of the Minneapolis co Library called Mountaineering Freedom of the Hills. There was nobody climbed in those days, honest to God. I never found another climber on these cliffs. 
Um, but by the time I was 18, I was mastering the skills, doing overhangs. Um, at 18, I was doing wall climbs. And uh, this is where I wanted to be. I, I really wanted, I liked heights. I wanted to master this. And this is where I, I did, I'm a very average person. Um, we did a trip, uh, the European Space Agency did a, uh, three years study of us when we crossed the Antarctica. We had six people from six cultures. The end product was that we were abnormally normal, <laughs> which I knew we were. Uh, but where I veered off actually from my peers uh, was this here. Uh, I sought out the edge. I wanted to be right on that edge where I had to be in that moment where I could smell the cliff and I could smell the sweat of my body and I would make that next move and be right in that moment. I was, not, I was not a thrill seeker. Thrills are cheap, and this type of situation, you know, thr thrills are deadly. But uh, with this in mind, uh, by the time I was 20, I was in the, in the high mountains in making, I did three first ascents in 1965 in uh, the Peruvian Andes. However, I was sidetracked from my career climbing, and I realized there, there's an incredible energy to climbing. It's, it's addictive. Uh, but I knew if I continued climbing, I probably wouldn't see my 40th birthday. Uh, and it was very easy to make that transition because as a boy in Minnesota here, lakes and water, I lived on lakes and water all the time, and I took up kayaking. Again, back in the 60s, of all the kayaking I did in the state and practicing, I never saw another kayak. I learned about a, a kayak in the National Geographic, and it made a lot of sense. Canoes fill up with water, and with the kayak, you can, you can go in really extreme water. And... Um, I did over 10,000 miles of kayaking before I was 21 uh, on the northern rivers, um, learned to roll, and uh, you know, sometimes three, 400 miles from the nearest village. Uh, but again, it's a mastery of skills, and uh, you know, it enabled me. This was 19 years old, uh, leaving Jasper, Alberta, uh, which is the um, Canadian Rockies. We left here. This was a coming of age for me, 19. We paddled 3,000 miles that summer. We went to the Arctic, all the way to the Arctic Ocean. We portaged over the mountains, Richardson Mountains, down south into Alaska, came back. And then I had the idea of buying land then when I hitchhiked back. And I actually, when I came back from this trip, I, I bought land in Ely, which I'll show you in a second. I did other long trips in the Arctic, uh, rafting and all sorts of adventures. But I bought... A, this property right, right here on this small little lake on the far side, I had an idea when I was hitchhiking when I was 15, 19, of finding something three miles from the nearest road, two lakes from the road, because you could move your supplies across in the lake rather than handling them. And I actually went to Ely looking around for about three, four days. I actually found exactly what I was looking for. And it was here that I built uh, my home. I still live here. My value has always been the simple life. Uh, in our home, uh, you were very fortunate to find a hammer. Uh, my parents had no woodworking skills, but I, again, any, any young kid that has this innate uh, goal in their life, something that's really close to your heart, they'll, they'll crash through almost any barriers to achieve that if you only let them out, out of the cage. And I learned very quickly at a young age, uh, I didn't see barriers. I wanted to do something, I did it, but I was organized, I was disciplined when I had to be, and I built this cabin, uh, started building this cabin, and um, I moved out. My goal was to get my degrees out of the way. I have a degree in geology at St. Thomas, master's at St. Thomas, and three years of teaching. So when I was 25, the goal was I moved out of the, out of the city permanently, moved to Ely where I started working on my homestead. My goal was to be self-sufficient. Uh, for 12 years, I lived on less than 2,000 a year, but we still, and that included a month, month vacation in Santa Barbara. And, uh, but it was a great life. This is 1970, my mother here, uh, next to my gardens. Um, <clears throat> we raised a considerable amount of our food. We hunted and fished, uh, built everything. Um, <clears throat> back in the hippie days here. <laughs> uh, but these two hippies didn't sit on the street corner smoking dope. We were working 16 hours a day. Uh, my goal was to build a homestead, to clear the land by hand, dig the ditches and so forth. My, my partner here was a fellow teacher that I taught with, and Bob moved up. Back was Bob. In the early, 60, early 70s, to make a living, I did a couple things. I taught courses around homesteading, how to chainsaw, how to woodwork, how to make bread, how to plant a garden. And, um, and it was my first, this is my first puppy here in 1972. I felt I could make a, a living um, with running dog sleds in the, in the bounty waters and in, in the quetical, taking groups out. No one had ever run a business like that. 
I'd never been on a dog sled before, but uh, I leased out four dogs and a lot of trial and error and my first puppies here that were born. And I started to get a really good dog team together, uh, which enabled me now to bring in supplies and also to make a living. I ran a winter school for 12 years, actually. I spent 12 full winters outside from mid-December to April. And uh, we lived in wood. We lived under tarps. We didn't do tents. Uh, so it was, it was a great life. And this was really skill building and comfort level for myself. This is our base camp here in Ely where I ran. Uh, there's a lodge here where people sleep, a woodworking shop, uh, storage areas and that. All my expeditions were based out of there, trained out of there. I've done um, my whole school in the 70s. I do a lot of work with teachers and students there <clears throat> today. And uh, of course that led me to polar exploration. Because uh, 82, um, I basically turned my, I turned my business over to Paul Schricke. It's now Wintergreen. And I left on a year and a half expedition. Uh, we traveled 7,000 miles, and that was the beginning of, of, of that career. I mentioned I did mainly uh, teams of uh, six people, international teams, 30 dogs, three dog teams. And uh, this is the beginning of my career here. Uh, the slides I have here are from Antarctica. Um, we crossed the longest possible route. Uh, 3,700 and some miles. Uh, on expeditions like this, um, you know, there's, it's, it's pretty incredible. There, there's fierce storms, wind chills, 100 below were very common, cramped tents, dripping tents. These are an ordinary part of your life. But believe it or not, it's really not much on your mind. You, you, you write about the hardships sometimes because it gives you something to write about, but it's nothing that really dominates your, your mind. Of course, you're very careful not to freeze fingers or do anything that's limb or life-threatening. Of course, that's something you always watch out for. I've never froze fingers or toes, uh, but it's extreme adventure. It was the extreme adventure that drew the six of us from six countries to Antarctica to do this traverse to begin with. Uh, we navigated hidden grass fields and high glaciers, mountain descents with heavily loaded uh, sleds. We had storms, one prolonged storms. One was 60 days long. And uh, we, we, uh, our survival depended on teamwork, you know, both men and dogs. The dogs were especially bred for the hard conditions. Our strength was bonded by our cooperation and working together. And basically, unlike on any expedition, uh, this one was 222 days. It was all about problem, problem solving all the way across Antarctica. We were on unknown territory, a thousand miles that had never been crossed, another 2,000 miles in the winter that had never been in in the winter. Uh, we had lots of tricks up our sleeves, a lot of experience, good dogs, and we just figured things out along, along the way. Uh, there was an intense monotony, that's something you don't really realize on, on these expeditions. Um, on the high plateau of Antarctica, which was uh, almost 3,000 miles, we traveled for 140 days at average 10,000 up to 12,000 feet. Uh, the challenge here is the passing time in your mind on the challenges and the fast fields and that, that's really action oriented. You're really just glued in all the time. Uh, you don't have any time for daydreaming and that, but the monotony is a special challenge. To get across, um, we worked up a system where we would travel 10 long hours, half an hour off within that. We did 10 days on, one day off, 10 days on, one day off, so three days off and a whole month. This is a perfect uh, pace because uh, on a long distance like this, it's like long distance running. If you burn your dogs out, the game's over. You've got to maintain right on that peak with both men and dogs. And with 10 days on, one day off, it was just enough to rest and to go almost perpetual motion. If you did 11 days, you'd burn out. Nine days, since we had that second winter at the high elevation, the coldest place on earth was on our heels, 11 days off, we'd be caught in this winter and we just wouldn't make it out. Um, there was no guarantees that we were going to make it off the continent, um, and our, you get so tired of thinking about the non-existent past, and you're just stuck in your thoughts, and that's what you deal with. Uh, everyone handled it in a different way. But for myself, uh, the entire expedition experience is like a mobile Zen monastery. Uh, to survive, we lived in a world where our minds were free and intuitively alive. That's the key here. You're, you're right in the moment. You're intuitive. That's what keeps you alive. You act out of, not thought, like my big decisions never come from my mind. I always know the decisions. Uh, there's this meditative rhythm that's really beautiful, very strict 
regimen that makes up our days. Utter simplicity. Uh, Eric talked about cutting off the toothbrush. I mean, you're down to the minimal. You cut off the toothbrush because that's extra weight that the dogs don't have to pull for seven months. Simplicity rules, which dictates uh, dictated the elimination of all that was unnecessary. Again, on the surface, this might sound a little crazy and grueling, but I felt this incredible freedom of thought, something I've only experienced on these long expeditions. I travel in a peaceful state that was not cluttered at all by the chatter of thinking, something very hard to do. This fostered inspiration and creativity through these long hours of confinement in the tents and across the harsh blankness of the polar plateau. Uh, this was a uh, lunch break photo. Um, I make my living in four areas. I've supported, as you're going to see, this, this center that I'm building. I, I, that's self-supported in the last 25 years. And I make my living photography, writing, uh, clothing designs, and uh, lecturing. But in this case here, I work with North Face designers. I've always had access to the best designers uh, in, in the outdoor industry. In fact, they're all all my good friends, the founders of North Face and all, Marmot, all these countries. Uh, I've climbed with these guys and women, and uh, we know each other very well. Uh, but in Antarctica, <coughs> uh, North Face, when they used to make all manufacture all the time in Berkeley, they literally closed down their plant for three weeks to make our clothing. And so I had, I had the access here to designers, and we, we did the, I did the complete designs for 14 pieces of our clothing. I also chose the colors. Colors are very important. Uh, for one, the, the function of the colors are, of course, visibility, safety. In low lighting and storms, uh, you can see each other. We had various colors like this. You could actually tell who, who was who by the colors. Uh, this picture here, I actually designed all the colors here, the thermoses, uh, the dog lines. Every color you see here, I, I color coordinated it uh, for visibility, uh, there's another thing that's important, and when I we went to the North Pole, we were all dressed in red, and we got so sick of looking at each other. <laughs> and here, and it's a, it's a big deal, because if a person's dressed in orange in a tent, and you're looking at them, and they're looking at you. So the colors are good for psychologically, and for friendship and keeping the mentality down. But it also, in photography, this, this picture was voted 50 top pictures of all time by Geographic, and it was possible because I was able to get a, get a camera out at 45 below here in the wind. But also, if somebody had a brown jacket on, you might as well not even bother. So there's, <laughs> take the picture, so it's that. And um, on, the, on the expedition, we were 17 miles from the end of this expedition. And this horrendous storm came up. We had 80 below weather just above us at 12,000 feet. The ocean was still super warm from the summer. So with the, this combination of warm moisture, cold colliding, uh, we had a biggest storm I've ever seen. It wasn't a super cold storm, but the winds and the, and the amount of snow in it was incredible. My Keizo Fanatsu there in Jap Japanese thing uh, in the middle here, he went out uh, in the afternoon in, in this storm to feed his dogs, and he disappeared. And we found that he was missing. And uh, so we did a 13-day, 13-hour uh, rescue. Per Behagen, raise your hand, my photographer. Per was in on that rescue. <laughs> he can tell some of the stories. And uh, the reason why we stayed safe, not losing everybody else and finding uh, Kezo was the color combination, but we also used the reflective, our patches, our flags were reflective from the 3M fabric. And in 92, I worked with, uh, 91, I worked with Land Sen. I asked this company, could you make that into like a, a rope, reflective rope? And we used that on our clothing, on our clothing line we did with Land Sen. And that took off just like that. Now you see all the bike clothing, all the reflective, that was basis came from this patch situation. And I've done a number of designs uh, that are in the mainstream that doesn't have my name on it, but that, that's okay with me. And clothing is a great thing is that you can rip off any design you want and they can rip off any design you want. You can just take whatever and put it together. So you see your designs all over. Um, this is uh, <clears throat> the end of the expedition. Um, I talked about the power of small groups. Uh, six, six, seven, eight, uh, all my life I've worked with this dynamics. Uh, it's the best dynamics there is. And when you're cooperating and working together, especially when you're inspired around a common goal or for the betterment of something, when you reach that mutual inspiration, being inspired is incredible yourself. 
I think you've, you've seen this before. Incredible things happen. And this is what I wanted, wanted to do all my life. I wanted to create a center where I could bring key decision makers and, and leaders together to make breakthrough work uh, that would be for the betterment of the world. If I had the center up right now, I would have the management and uh, head administrations of the, uh, the orchestra, and we'd work out, we'd figure it out. We, we would close the doors, and uh, I, don't, I, don't say that, I don't say that to be facetious, but it's that situation that you can get down. You can't do that sitting around in a, in a hotel room. Uh, the Will Steger Foundation, along with Fresh Energy, we wrote basically the climate policy for the state in December and January. The governor asked us to present with him the policy for the state. We did that. And uh, if the center was up right now, we'd be working at implementing that. We, we would get put together people of all different thoughts and, and, and close the doors in the wilderness and do that. And it was along the expedition that I did the designs for the center. I had this vision 20 years before that. But I actually came up with the designs because I was in this headspace of creativity. And uh, this is where I, I kind of put this all together. Uh, this is a composite of a number of designs. I worked with Paul Armseth, and I came back. I did four elevations like this, and, and we pretty much kept it to exactly how I had earlier conceived it. And uh, I have a video here that I wanted to show you, but uh, I want to talk a little bit about how I designed this. So this is what I thought about in Antarctica. In my mind, I dwelled in this structure, walked through it constantly, and living in every room during all seasons. I observed the moon and the sun passing through its windows. I paid attention to the shadows, the lines of the roofs and railings, the reflection of the stars in the atrium windows. In the tent every morning with a pencil and a six inch ruler, I would draw into reality my ideas and plans from the day before. It was a long and a beautiful experience. At the end of the expedition, with drawings in hand, I set out on a 25 year project to build the Steger Wilderness Center. For myself, architecture has always been a way of capturing the beauty of nature. I was, it was no easy task to envision a large structure that would exist in harmony with the wilderness that surrounds it. The power of the northern wilderness is enormous, and I have the utmost faith in that power of the wilderness to give us the answers we need. The solitude and the beauty of the wilderness setting will assure outcomes that reflect deep concentration and rejuvenation of thought and mind. This also, as a designer and a builder, uh, one selfish reason I did this building, because I wanted to design it, but I also wanted to do all the woodworking, the cabinets, the doors, the windows, uh, the whole thing, the ultimate challenge. And uh, it's set north of Ely, um, pristine wilderness. Uh, it's, very beautiful spot. Uh, I've, I've designed it around, again, interaction. Seven, eight people, the bottom floor is a conference room for formal. The third floor with the decks here is where you eat and dine and you relax. And it's probably leaning over these railings here where the big, big decisions will be made. Uh, but it's been a great, great process here of doing this. This I took with a crane. It was a lot of fun operating this thing up and down and around. And, but um, this gives you a good bird's eye view here of what this looks like. But I want to share with you here some of my photographs that John took. Uh, first of all, the process. This is uh, 40 years ago when there's no road. And um, this is how I do things. It's always with the help of my friends. I'm never a, a, a loner or the guy that takes the credit. I always work with other people. And the reason I'm here talking with you is because of so many thousands of people that have worked quietly with me, donated so much time to causes and that, but I see myself as a, a catalyst. But when you have friends, it's a lot of work and a lot, a lot of commitment you see here. And um, just a uh, flashback here to just a month ago, we're working with interns and apprentices here, but it's this type of work and uh, community here that uh, of all the labor. I wanted to do one large building with tens and tens of hundreds of thousands of hours of craftsmen and volunteer work of building that uh, would reflect 
even to a person that's not aware, but feels something from that, from that contribution of energy in that. And uh, this is how it sets uh, in a beautiful place. When I first came to this land, I kayaked over to first looked at it. I uh, walked up to the space where the building was, and I put a log down. I told my brother this is where I was going to build my home. But I ended up building my home down on a ledge below that. But where I put the log was actually where this building was. And uh, this is the south side of it, uh, an atrium. Uh, you'll see the interior of it in a little bit. It's recycled dug fir posts and beams, real elegant. Uh, I work with some of the best, three of the top posts and beam people in the state on this. Took three years, 300 cuts. Uh, the real functional part of this is it's a passive solar, 30 below. It's warm enough inside there, 30 below to melt butter. So, <laughs> so you get an incredible solar game. It they, they actually touches the bottom here on the south side. And as you go down around the sides here, this, you're viewing the north, northern wall, the Saturn window, uh, this egg window here. This is the north face of it. Um, I planted trees around it. This, this building will be in fruition 60, 70 years from now when the trees that I've planted are towering white pines over it. That's when this whole building will be you know, at, at its best. And um, I'm always about planting seeds and trees. I plant 2,000 trees a year, and I've done that for most of my life. And uh, it takes time to make things happen. It takes time to build relationships. And, uh, but this, I'm hoping, as a legacy, will move way, well beyond my, myself here. This is the inside under construction. Saturn window that's giving me all sorts of opportunities for design and work here. This is some of the posts and beam work. Uh, 600 joints that had to fit within a 16th of an inch for this whole thing to come together. Uh, we assembled, we built a special garage for it to put the, uh, to pound out these joints for three years. Then we, then we assembled it with a crane. Uh, this I call it, two, I always wanted to do a two-story window. This is an egg window. I call it the egg. The bottom here actually is the kitchen sink of the third floor. When you're washing dishes, you're looking out. So, and then the top floor, which I have a picture of here, right here, that's the top of the egg. This is more of a study of production area where you put together uh, film or when you bring a group of people where you're producing. I do a lot of that or design. Uh, close-up design where you live together for a week or whatever time it takes to do it. Uh, there'll be a big, big space here, a big deck spa uh, uh, desk space here. Then there's the look at this in details here. The detail work, tons of details. All the all the wood, all the windows are homemade. It's taken 10 years to do these inter uh, these windows. Um, 20,000 a year for 10 years, and uh, everything. It's two stories of stone, three stories of dovetailed. Joints very cut like this. Uh, some incredible uh, log builders up in Ely, Barry Bassant and some of his crew uh, did the log building. Uh, we were a couple years on that. We put it up with a crane. Um, and then all, all the detail work, uh, the benches here. I work a lot with uh, recycled wood. This is recycled uh, redwood from um, Chicago. This is the third floor deck looking from the fifth floor. That deck system is uh, made for, again, it's the where you eat and dine and the, the informal, this, this spills out. It's really incredible views from there, very inspiring. Like I said, I think most of the decisions are made usually informally. And, and, and working in this way in small groups, it's really about building relationships with each other. Because in your everyday life, you have meetings and so forth, but it's hard to make these uh, relationships. And when you build relationships, it's not like, okay, we'll see each other. The whole idea here is thought to action and the, something that's going to continue after, after the, the program is there. Conservatory, uh, the little conceivable here for eating. Uh, copper roofs, everything's copper on the roof. Um, I do a lot of tile work. Uh, I just love tile design. The advent of the internet has changed everything because uh, uh, all the third world countries have uh, quarries and through the internet you have access to all the stone of the world at a very reasonable price. Uh, I mean, stone used to sell good stone, twenty-five, thirty dollars a square foot. Uh, you can get it now for four dollars a square foot. It's real accessible. And uh, I laid out this plan here for the main conference room on the first floor. This is the floor when it's laid up. It's actually kind of a Grecian Roman design. Uh, and uh, part of the design here, uh, you deal with squares, sixteen by sixteen, eighteen by eighteen, twenty-four by twenty-four. But you have breakage and you have a waste, so a, a good design utilizes all the small parts. There's little pieces in the center here that are two by two, and in the end, you just have a small pile of 
of scraps. And then we utilize those scraps to build intricate detail like that. We did this, uh, all the, I, I do a, a, a summer program here, it's called the master's program. I have three masters in stone and one master in tile. These are guys in their 50s, 60s, height of their career. And uh, I take on six, seven apprentices that work under them on a six week program and I guarantee the apprentices that they'll learn everything they need to know about tile and stone and also they'll be in great shape at the end of it. <laughs> but what we did here with the scraps is the, the assignment then, then the apprentices would make all the tile hearths around all the stoves in the homestead. This is the third floor uh, balcony here. And um, I always wanted to do stained glass, uh, but I never could get too enthusiastic about lead and fumes and stuff. Uh, but then I figured out a way of doing stained glass with uh, intricate uh, work in, in my shop. I work a lot with routers and shapers where I'm able to work with, you know, down to a thousandth of an inch and I can do it in mass production. In fact, that's how I, I will be doing the furniture and the woodworking here because you know, I don't have a whole lifetime here to do the cabinets where you have to have router work, something where with a team of people you can put together things reasonable. But um, I'm still learning on the, on the glass as a work in progress. Uh, I've done a number of the cabins, all so I have glass and a houseboat I live on. I'm now doing the doors on that and the windows. And I'm working up my skill level. I've been working my skill level for the last 30 years to work into the interior of the building, which I'll be starting on uh, this winter. And a um, number of glass work. <clears throat> I'll answer the first question I always get. Oh, I see Frank Lloyd Wright there. Yeah, I was inspired. Frank Lloyd Wright was a, a huge inspiration for me. Um, what, I, what Frank Lloyd Wright taught me, first of all, I, I went way into his history and found out where, where was his inspiration? Where did he get these ideas? And I then went through those sources uh, to those ideas, and then I expanded on that and was able to really broaden my design. And a lot of times, as you know, if you're a designer, you hit a wall. I'm always able to break out of that through that. Uh, Wright also taught me about, uh, big time, about thinking out of the box, because a number of times in my lighting, uh, I, I bought about 40% of the lighting on the European lighting, basically, on the, on the building, the bigger building, and I, I couldn't figure out how to do the other 60%, and i now doing my own lighting, and Wright taught me to, I broke out of that box. Uh, my main inspiration, Wright has been an inspiration, but North American Indians really have been a great inspiration. I used to beat as a young kid, uh, always interested in ba uh, basket weaving and so forth. This is our Indian design here. And uh, of course, Japanese design is an another one. But in my, and a lot of my windows are just original because you get ideas and so forth. And um, I mean, it's no fun copying somebody. Uh, sometimes it's good to copy just to understand how it was made. Uh, but I was able to do, this is that first piece of glass I did. But uh, some, some of the work, I've learned a lot about glass. For example, I found out where Wright got his glass, and lo and behold, Kokomo Glass in Indiana, still a thriving com co company. Um, I buy my glass there. Uh, uh, R J. Ring and uh, St. Paul, great people there, warehouse. That's where I get all my glass, and they help me out. But I've, uh, the Kokomo Glass actually specializes glass for me now. So I can, I can specialize it. Just like Frank took, Wright took innovations, electricity, clear glass, and then he took those to the limit. There's so many new innovations now with LED lighting and just everything that's out there now. So there's a lot of latitude. And then the detail work on this is what I really like. I, assembling is, is, is the challenge because everything has to be within a thousandth of an inch because if, you, if you're off at all, everything's off and it's just a nightmare putting this together. Uh, but I've, lear I've learned the system. I do doors. Um, I usually do doors in batches of 10 or 12. Uh, all my doors are almost all recycled or, or native or local woods, but mostly recycled. I, I don't buy wood, uh, uh, actually, maybe a little bit of uh, construction with two by fours here and there. I do furniture. I'll be doing all the furniture and for that. Um, bookshelves. Uh, I'm mastering dovetail. I mean, through, through the router, you can be accurate just down to the middle, millimeters. And, uh, and all this has been, like I said, uh, uh, lighting, some of the lighting I did here, my cabin. I used my cabin as a uh, kind of a experimental part. Details like this. This is recycled redwood. My friend Jim Paulson, he took the siding off his house, a 50s house, his painted redwood. Uh, we ran it through the planer, milled it up like this, and then reused it. 
And uh, this is some of the uh, uh, redwood, recycled redwood. I, I found, I was always shopping around for recycled wood, but I found an old timer in Chicago that's been recycling before it became a fad here 30 years ago. And he took me under his wing. He, he's crazy about wood like I am. Uh, my father used to get me uh, a little upset with me because I would never save money. I'd always buy wooden tools. <laughs> and uh, this guy was the same way. So I would buy, literally from the, tr I buy a truckload from him. Uh, and the truckload, he always gave me a really good amount of wood, really the best quality. And this is how I was able to stock up with wood here. This is redwood. This is a, um, it's called the, I call it the bean table. It was, it'll be on the third floor there where people eat. Uh, it's made for 12 people. The center is made for interaction, seven, eight, but a maximum of 12, no more, no over 12. Because you always have to have facilitators or photographers or whatever. You have to have allow that extra three or four leeway there. But this, this uh, bean is made for 12 people. Uh, I'm designing the furniture around this. And it's also made that you face each other rather than the rectangular table like we had when I was raising, when young kids when we were young, we had this long table that we ate at, kind of like the Last Supper type table. But this one is, uh, this is recycled yellow pine from the warehouses. I do a lot of work with yellow pine. I really like yellow pine. Uh, myself, again, I'm kind of coming, I'm really coming out of the closet as a designer and kind of exposing a uh, big part of my life that I've never, people know me, know me, but I, I never talk about uh, my work. It's always been private to me. And uh, I'm launching it now to, to get the center going. But um, this is my situation here in the shop. I'm in this type of a get up and doing in the work in the shop more than I'm at on expeditions. Uh, the uh, dog sledding is, and uh, I work with all the, all the power tools. All this I learned was self-taught. I have all my fingers. Um, I work a lot with chainsaws, table saws alone. I'm very careful. And I've learned that on expeditions, but uh, I, I love shop work. I, I generally, um, I've been committed right now for the Will Steger Foundation the last six years, and, and I've lived down here for that. But normally I would work a full season from October through April, you know, six days a week in the shop. I, I, live, I live the designs. I usually work with one or two apprentices that uh, I learn, we learn from each other, and um, it's just a great, great time closing the door and, being in that space of creativity and uh, uh, assembling. Building is, uh, is, is really my middle name, building and education. This is my cabin that I built. Um, when you're 19, this is where you put your cabin on a ledge overlooking the lake. <laughs> uh, my goal of simplicity and self-sufficiency is something I was born with. Uh, I have uh, solar and, and wind power for the last 25 years. Before that, it was kerosene. Lamps, I have satellite, you know, always, always had satellite, internet connections since the very beginning here. Uh, off grid, I was off the road for 25 years. I have a road now. I had to put a road in order to comp do this uh, center. It was the biggest compromise in my life was a road. Uh, I never thought I'd have a road, but I just didn't question it. I just put it in because to do the center, that's what it took. Uh, but my cabin is very simple. Uh, heat with wood, uh, water from the lake or from the spring, uh, my total cost of fossil fuels is less than $50 a year, and uh, this is the way I, I've lived. Uh, this is a, inside of my cabin. The only things in the cabin I didn't make were these chairs. These are incredible chairs. Frank Carey, the, the, the famous designer here, did a number of buildings here. I think the um, Rudy Guthrie or Walker, uh, these chairs are can't, hard to improve on. But everything in my cabin, I have uh, window stores, bookcases, uh, my cabin has been a sort of an experiment for over the years, and because uh, you, you make something, you got to live with it. <laughs> and um, and usually, if you put your mind and your creativity into it, I find when I make something, it's great. I can live with it for 40 years. I don't get tired of it because uh, when I'm in that space, I know it's going to be around for a while, and I, I don't end up. Uh, sometimes, you know, if you look at something, I just end up tearing off things. Sometimes I don't like it, and then redoing it. Uh, my back room here, my library and so forth. Very contemplative place here I, I live in. It's just uh, very peaceful. A lot of skylights with mirrors on the skylights. Uh, living off grid like this, the uh, over lighting is fine. Uh, we do a lot of stone work. Uh, stone is uh, probably my, my best medium. Of, uh, the, the, the feel of stone, the permanence of stone. Um, when I'm in the storms and that in the polar regions, uh, my mind often goes to 
I, I put myself there of doing stonework where I feel the stone, I smell the stone, I'm experiencing the day, I'm in this moment. Uh, stone is the best teacher, I think, of any, any craft. And uh, we do walls, we do everything in stone. Uh, the interior work has been a seven year project, believe it or not. Next year, the inside here, or eighth year, will of tile and stone will be finally finished. And, uh, and then this is uh, my, my cabin here, I have little, call them spot gardens, but gardens like this. And again, I, I raise a lot of my food in the summer. Uh, I've always done that. Uh, I, I don't like buying greens if I can raise them and so forth. It's relatively simple, a little bit of work in the spring and some weeding and that. You, and it's always difficult for me to uh, come down to the city. I love it down here. I love the society and all my friends. But it's hard to leave your garden in September because it's flourishing. You could actually be living on it till Christmas. I built root cellars and ice houses all my life and store the vegetables. But stonework, again, this is a great teacher of stone. Uh, these are four or five of my apprentices from last year uh, working under the stone ma masters. And uh, they did their own walls. It was incredible what we produced last year. I told them at the beginning about the power of seven, eight interaction. And yeah, it was a concept to them. But they all came up to me at one time or another during it or after. They saw what seven is, uh, the interaction, how everyone got along just so well. There, there was this power of this creativity, and uh, we live together as a community. Everybody sleeps in their own tent. They don't sleep inside. We have a communal area where we uh, do our own food, a lot of the foods from the garden. Uh, we have grain, have a grain mill. We do our own bread and so forth. And then our apprentices then work with other volunteers, and Minnesota Conservation Corps comes up. So they're... So the apprentices teach the interns and, and, and the volunteers. So there's this tier of teaching. Uh, one of my favorite qu uh, pictures is of Frank Lloyd Wright when he was an older man, and they were looking over drawings. And he had about 12 apprentices over, and they were all learning from this guy and this uh, passing the knowledge from master to apprentice. And the apprentice actually teaches the master. It's not like oh, I'm the teacher, I'm the guy. Uh, the great thing about teacher is you're learning all the time. You're not the, you're not the master and that type of foolishness where you put someone above yourself and the guru and all this stuff. Uh, you're, I learn from these MC Minnesota Conservation Corps. I learn a lot from these young kids. I'm always around 20-year-olds and a couple of good friends say, well, they're the only people that can keep up with you. <laughs> but the 20-year-old generation is uh, not a cliche. They're, they're an incredible generation. They're going to inherit this environmental mess that we so blindly have gone into without even any thought at all. Uh, so they're, they're the ones that are going to be straighten things out and they're going to have to adapt around it. This is Ian, one of my uh, stonemasons, showing the MCC interns here what to do. Um, I'm always on site. I mean, I'm, I, I'm working right there. I mean, I'm, I, I, I'm all over the place here. But we, we sift our own, our own um, sand. Uh, we, we, uh, quarry our own rocks from around. Everything is by hand. We don't buy this stuff. We, it's all by hand. And uh, here's the great John Ratzlaff here with his camera. He's always around photographing, and John's always there around very quietly, very self-assuming uh, person. And I spend a lot of time, the young people that are up, you know, we spend a lot of evenings talking and questioning. And again, it's not just me giving off the information. I, their learning and their questions are incredible. So this is on my porch here, a lot of good times. This is in the lodge here where <clears throat> all my expeditions were hatched and planned. And uh, this is a group from Anoka Community College up in Cambridge. My good friend Peter Wallstrom uh, has brought up kids uh, for almost five, six years right now. We, we do this a lot. They come up and they learn. They do programs. They plan, they're planning out their activities for their environmental club here. And uh, and then Jim, Jim Sullivan, a great friend of mine. Uh, I've, I've majored in geology, graduated nine years behind me, but he went into uh, masonry, a uh, rock specialist, and uh, he's, one, he's a great teacher. Um, and uh, we're going over the flow each of us, and uh, one of our, our apprentices here. Uh, and then this is help from friends, and this is, you can read the good, good spirit here. This is two years ago, and a lot of great friends here. And uh, this is a crew. We had this crew for two weeks uh, last year. And it's amazing how much stone you get, work you get done. We had th over 30 people for about four to five days here. So a lot of people working together. 
And then we have activities that I, I'm going to conclude here. Um, uh, I've been cutting ice since uh, 1967. And cutting ice means you cut ice in the winter and you put that ice in an ice house and then you preserve that ice throughout the summer. It gives you refrigeration. You have two things. You have a root cellar, which is just a cellar that's buried in. And that cellar, you know, from November up until July will stay almost 34 degrees. And then during the warmer months of the summer into the fall, we use ice in the ice house for refrigeration. <clears throat> I, never, I never use fossil fuels ever for refrigeration. Um, I consider root cellars, this is what they did 100 years ago. I mean, any, anybody, that's what, uh, cutting ice was very, very common. In fact, there's a, the ice house, what is it, the bar or whatever here on, on Nic Nicollet Avenue. That was an old ice house here at one time. So it's, it's an old art, but it's an art that's been around. But, so we have about 60 people come up on the weekend and we cut ice, haul it. Uh, we have Lisa Ringer brings her horses up and uh, we haul ice up the road to the ice house in the back here where we stack it. Now, if you were to go in my ice house right now, there's about a four foot pile of ice still in there. And then January, when we cut again, we just throw the old ice from the year out, out shovel the sawdust into the compost heap, and then put more ice and fresh sawdust on it. It's that simple. Um, <clears throat> my concluding slides here. Um, I'm always thinking, uh, you know, for the future. This is a tree I planted two years ago on the north, north side of the building. Uh, it's a little white pine that grew up, a uh, little skinny guy. Uh, this, this building, this, in 70 years, 80 years, this tree will dwarf the building. And that castle-like front now that's really barren and a little annoying, um, <laughs> that will make sense as this grow tree <coughs> dominates that. And, uh, and I think that's what, how we all think, especially as uh, we get on with little experience in age here. We're always looking at uh, the future. And my hope through the Steger Wilderness Center is to pass this on, to first of all, to, to conclude it, and then to program it. When we're, we are programming it now. Uh, we work in three areas. And of course, number one is a demonstration of renewables, something that we really need right now, a demonstration of biomass, solar. Uh, this is something, new technologies, we work with that. And then we work, the second area, of course, is the mastery of skills, uh, like the apprenticeship. We do that now in stone, we'll do it in wood, and we'll do it in other fields. And then the ultimate program, of course, is the leadership and um, leadership groups that I'll, I'll be running through. So I have to conclude this, build the program so the program is well-defined. And then the governance, the governance is very important to create a, uh, creating a nonprofit trust. Uh, my goal in my life is not to own anything. Ownership is such a drag, because <laughs> you have to support it. And within another year, I'm gonna be putting everything into uh, the trust, so I won't own it anymore, which is great, and I become a volunteer. So you have to build a board, and then you also have, a che have to have a check, checks and balancing on that board, because those of you who have run organizations and nonprofits, you know that you have a certain mission, and if that mission really has to be defined to carry it on. The mission is weak, you know, it'll go somewhere else. Or if you have a board and you get some power maniac on the board and takes control, and all of a sudden it's a ballet camp or something else going on. <laughs> and uh, so, so it's programming, the governance. And the governance to me is really, is challenging. I mean, I, it's something I thought about all my life. So that's, that's where I'm, I'm at at that. And, you know, we're just, I'm just getting starting on, the, on this. Uh, the Will Steger Foundation is really up and running thanks to my great staff. Nicole Rahm is here, my executive director. Uh, Janet is here, my uh, second in charge. And, uh, and we have four other employees, and we're really going strong right now. We're doing great work. Uh, and we're moving ahead, and we always need to fund the foundation, of course, too. That, that's a never-ending project, but with the great management we have, that's going fine. And I'm, I'm keeping my fingers in the pie on the foundation. I'm not moving away from my commitment there. But I'm moving ahead now to start a new nonprofit. It's like a new enterprise. And, um, you know, we, and I appreciate you know, all interests that you have in the, in the Wilderness Center. 
Um, we are now in the final stages of completing this. We are actively looking for partners and individuals. And we'd like to further engage everybody and, uh, that are interested in to help support us. We've got the website here. This is, here's the problem. When you're starting an organization, you're, you're hiring out the lawyers and you're doing this, but you need administration and you need someone to answer the phone or the internet. So we're in this stage right now. We have a website. I always had the Will Steger Foundation.org, so, or .com. Uh, if you're interested in that, check that out. And very soon, um, we'll be having more information on that and how to contact us and so forth as this grows. Uh, I'm down here straight on till New Year's and then going up to Ely for a quick break and down here in, in, in um, January. I'm, I'm working on this full time to get this going. And uh, we would really appreciate your support if it's possible. You can contact us through this here. I'm also see seeking, of course, guidance and counsel. Um, I'm, not a, I'm not a person like in Antarctica. I'm not the guy that care. I don't lead with a flag. That's totally absurd to me. I'm a democratic leadership. I rely always on other people. And um, if someone needs to take reins and there's hardships and so forth, I'll jump in there. And I'll take on all my team members if I have to, if there's a decision that's going to be the life and death of dogs and that, but only in a rare spot where I'll step on board like that. But I quietly lead from the back, and I, and I rely on leadership and counsel, and that's part of what I'm doing now is putting together a group of people that can help guide me uh, through, these, through, through this. It's, not, it's new territory, but it's, I've, I've been there before. And uh, regarding visiting at the, uh, the center, I mean, everybody wants to come and visit. Um, <clears throat> There, there's one issue is that it's a really pristine wilderness, and by the fact that it's pristine, numbers in the area, you know, wears it down and wears the literally the spirit out of it. So we are running uh, various intern master's programs. I do some programs there, but we will have a system down the line where we can, on certain days like in the summer, we'll arrange that where we can have visitors in mass to see the project up there. But, it, but it's a it's a very del delicate balance. I mean, I've always kept my private life to myself and my life up there. I never talked about it in the public. And I'm opening it up my whole life right now to that. And again, I, I, I'm, I'm confident. I, I, I'm not going to lose my privacy. And because if I lost my privacy, I'd run away. But I wouldn't run away because I wouldn't lose my privacy because I'll organize it in such a way. <laughs> Uh, that I can share it with other people because that's very important to me. So, uh, so I want to thank everybody for coming out. This is an extremely special night for me. Uh, you know, I'm coming out and sharing all this with you, and I'm mean, looking in the audiences. I, I just can't tell you how fortunate I am to have so many friends from different walks of life that have supported me uh, throughout my life. And uh, I'm not sure if we have room for some questions here. I want to just put one plug in first. John has this incredible book, uh, photographic book. It's $100, proceeds go directly to the starving uh, artist. And John's put so much selfless time in this. Uh, it features this, we haven't explained it, but the wood here is from scrap wood, recycled wood from my doors. You have small scraps that you normally would put in the killing. We save it all and we made, we made all these bindings. This is, I know where every door this was. This is a recycle, this is a, uh, yellow pine here from the from the houseboat. This one is my houseboat uh, in uh, redwood, which is the core of the one of the doors that I did. So they all have a, this unique little history behind it. So John has that door. He, he actually has a uh, credit card operation there, so you can charge it. I also have my book Crossing Antarctica there, which has been out for a long time. A uh, story about uh, that crossing. And let's see here. Yeah, yeah Carrie, what what should we do? You want do we have time for? I don't want to. I know the babysitter is probably getting nervous right now. If anyone has to step Hello. up, you're not going to insult me yeah. by leaving. So, Are there questions from the audience? We do have a microphone, or Will's more than willing. Yeah, thanks. Food. What did, what did you eat on the exploration? Okay, what did we eat? Very good question. First of all, we're limited to two pounds, yeah. two ounces of food a day. Okay, so, and that... You know, that's, uh, what is it, uh, 60 pounds of food. You have, to, you have to pack out all this, but weight is everything. So you're, you're limited within that parameter. 
But basically, if we're in the polar regions, uh, there's no wildlife in that, so we're on a, like a rations. But we use, everything we eat is organic. Uh, we do a lot of, a lot of grains or carbohydrates. It would be oatmeal, bread, nuts. Uh, Lynn Gordon has been my sponsor of bread ever since 88 when she first came online. So we use her organic bread, rice, pasta, a lot of butter, and cheese. You need to get, within that two pounds, you need uh, 6,000 calories just to maintain. Because in the super cold weather, your body is continually giving off heat. You don't go into a warm space. You're, it's always cold. When you crawl into your sleeping bag at night, it's 40 below in that bag, and you've got to get that up to 98 degrees. So you're using up the calories. So uh, the, the fat is very, very important. And uh, it's a diet that gets really monotonous. Uh, but, you know, you have to. I've, I had to force feed myself in Antarctica to get those calories in in order to keep my strength during the day so I wouldn't get cold. But if I maintain enough calories in me, I can maintain my inspiration uh, somewhat dur during the day. So uh, when I'm traveling in the Arctic regions, which I am often am, where you have wildlife, and when I'm traveling with the Indians or in the Indians, northern Indians, Athabascan Indians, and you know what, I eat a lot of uh, game. Um, Eric and I lived a lot on caribou. Um, I eat caribou raw, and uh, normally if I have my druthers, uh, if I'm traveling alone where I don't have to compromise my diet, uh, I eat about three pounds of caribou every night raw. Uh, the natives all eat one big meal uh, in the evening. I, I float that in melted butter and float, float cheese around it. I call it a heart attack special. <laughs> and, uh, and then in the morning, I have a little bit of oatmeal, and I don't eat during the day. I, I drink a lot of water. And if you ask almost any male hunter, Indian or Inuit, what is your favorite food? They'll go, caribou. The caribou gives you this incredible strength. Uh, that over a period of time, it's just, you know, it builds your muscles. I also eat, uh, on the sea ice, I eat seals. Sea, sea, uh, seals is, seal is really the best meat in, uh, in the cold because it's fatty. Uh, it took me a while, a couple days to get used to it, but in 30, day, 30 below, 40 below, your mind craves it. And, I, and actually when it's like 40, 50 below, my mind is on seal meat, that's what I think about. <laughs> but then ironically enough, when it get, warms up to 10 below zero, you know, Fahrenheit, you, you lose your craving for fats. That disappears. I don't think about greens or I, I don't fantasize about food when I'm away. I'm generally, uh, I, in my heart, I carry my loved ones. But you know, I think about stone building and, and so forth, but I'm pretty much in the present. I, I don't think about too much counting days down and all that. Yes. Um, you mentioned how it was like a mobile monastery in the yeah. Zen on the expeditions. Yeah. How do you take that back to everyday life with you? Do you meditate? What's your... Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. Um, it, it mean, I, had a, I have a quote in, on the quote wall there about uh, two worlds or something like that. That first, in my mind, I, I see there's, there's this contemplative wilderness space of your mind where there's no incursion of anything. And then there's our civilized life, structured and busy. And it took me a while when I was younger to, put, to come to grips with both these, because I would always compare one against another. But I've learned a long time ago just to live. When I'm in the city, I'm in the city. And when I live in the city, uh, how I learned to manage my stress, I can take that on an expedition. And what I learned on the expedition, I take it here. There isn't such a thing as I'm here, and then I'm here. My life is pretty much a continual whole. And there's interruptions here and there because, you know, life is that way sometimes. But um, I, don't, I don't meditate. I mean, um, I, sp I had a stint in a Zen monastery in my late 20s when I was in real situation with myself, a serious situation that I had to come to grips with. And that, that was very powerful at that time. It got me back online, got me, actually saved my life at that time. Uh, but the, the wilderness travel that I do, that's, sort of my meditation, living, woodworking, living in Ely. Uh, but I'm very calm most of the time here, except for sometimes during exhibition times here. <laughs> uh, and when I came here, my car died. <laughs> I'm, I'm rushing, and my car died in the middle of a one-way street. It just died. <laughs> so I had to get here. Luckily, it was down the block. I, there's a guy sitting on a porch. I gave him 20 bucks and my, or $40 in my keys, got his phone number. <laughs> 
And um, my usual luck with my friends made some calls, and this toad is in a garage now. Uh, so, I mean, that's, you know, that's how life is for me. That's how, how it is always, you know. Uh, so if you just, you know, don't get too excited about stuff, but, you, you know, you've got to get excited sometimes. But, no, no, it's, it's, it's a process. But um, I live on the river. Um, I've been um, staying with Nina, and my, three of my roommates are here. In Linden Hills, the last year and a half, my house was on dry dock. It's going back. My houseboat. It's going back on the water next week here. So um, I've loved my my life on the land, but on the river, it's just very beautiful. So I have a very privileged life. I mean, I, I made it that way. Uh, I mean, my luck was my parents. I was really lucky to have parents like that. The rest of my luck I've made myself. And when you have what you think is bad luck, that's your learning experience. You know, if something goes wrong, take a look at that. Or if you you hurt somebody or whatever, look at that straight on, because that's, that's where you're gonna learn. You know, don't hang on and torture yourself to death with some foolish act you did, and look at it, and then move on, and don't do it again, or if you do it again, be aware of it next time. And that's, that's how I live, that's just a great, great way. Yes, Mikey. So, uh, what are your next steps for the senior center over the next one, two, three years, and uh, what do you need to accomplish? Yeah, thank you, Mike, for that question. <laughs> <laughs> um, to bring it to completion, uh, I, have the, uh, I have a great deal of the infrastructure in, but I still have more infrastructure. I have to finish the building. The, the energy systems have to go in, more housing, and particularly I need to build what I call a lodge, a place where you eat, uh, really good quarters. And all, all these are design opportunities when you're, you're building this. But I do have to raise $2 million, something I've done before. It's a lot of money. Uh, I'm setting out to do that. and. Uh, I've self-funded it for the last 25 years. Um, I put in honestly between 150 to 200,000 a year. I don't. I don't have a rich uncle. Uh, I make that every year. You know, on a side, I make a living. I run the Will Steger Foundation. Uh, but that type of effort keeps me creative and motivated, and it brings me opportunities because, you know, when you're against the wall, it's not like I'm against the wall. But when you have to produce. Uh, you have to use your head, your intuition, and all that. These have been great things. That's why I am where I'm at right now. So, but it's at a point now where I, I've got to get this finished. I, you know, I, I would could do it another 20 years, but I, I, I really have to be, start involving. And I feel a need right now, because of the critical time that we are at. You don't realize just what's happening here, but we have really screwed the earth up, and there's going to be hell to pay what's coming. We're going to have to adapt to this. The great thing is we have the technology, we have the solutions through wise governance, through Mark Dayton, Governor Plenty signed on, 20% renewables. Uh, Mark and his administration, we had a great session last fall. Uh, we're moving this economy ahead. We're going, to, we're going to do this. So in Minnesota, we're going to set the example. But there's real critical things here. This is the most innovative time of the history of human beings. It's bigger than the industrial age. We're switching the energy structure and we're gonna clean up that despite the fossil fuel industry that has so much money, so much disinformation. There's such dirty politics here, but you're not gonna, if you get at, angry at it, forget it. You just gotta keep, keep working on it. So I have a, I feel a, a need, I've, I'm not a, I feel the timing is correct to get this going, because I, I feel we need to have other ideas. We have to have new types of thinking here. And, uh, and I want to be part of that in my, my own small way. And I want to hand the baton over uh, to something that uh, will go. This, like I say, this has been a plan all my life. To, I knew that I slowly worked my way, a grade school teacher, and all the way through. But if I could get myself to a point where I could work with leaders, and that means not just, you could build 20 of these buildings, but how are you going to draw the leadership uh, on there? And that's this, this dual purpose right now of getting, getting this together. So I'm out to do that. And uh, so, and any other questions? Maybe a couple more here. It's getting pretty late. Yes? I can't help but notice you. What was streamlining the pilot lightning? Yeah, lightning. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Enter Thompson Lightning uh, on St. Paul. Thompson is a company uh, that does all the lightning rods and I got to know the engineers there. They came out, you know, it's a real simple operation. Actually, they did the high points or 
And then uh, I, I rigged it up, and then they came back. And lightning is, it's all lightning rod, of course. What you do in lightning, of course, you have the rods, everything is connected, and there's a huge loop of copper around the building. And uh, what you want, you're not going to, if lightning strikes, it's too late, you know. You're, things are going to crack up pretty bad. But what you do is you keep that building so the ions or whatever doesn't mount where you get a lightning strike. It just neutralizes it constantly. So, And then Garlic French uh, did the roof. Uh, incredible people in St. Paul. Actually, two of my college classmates run Garlic French right now. Uh, they did that during the recession of 92, 93. Copper was cheap. Labor was cheap. Uh, they did that before the uh, beginning of the season. So I hit it right on the time there. That, that was a really high up job. Uh, but they did it just like that. Yeah, copper, by the way, uh, it's very expensive now, but copper, it's, this is a 100, 200 year roof. And uh, so investing in the material is secondary to the labor. A couple more questions here and then. Yes, the back there. Yes. So, so we're in the age of the internet currently. Do you have any vision to integrate that into maybe interconnecting this all in, in, in this vision that you have? Yeah. What was your first part? I didn't hear it. Uh, we're in the age of the internet yep. currently. So. Yep. Yeah. Actually, interesting you said that. <clears throat> um, I work. I work national and international on environmental issues. Right now, I'm just purely focused in Minnesota which gave me incredible opportunities of the people I met. I knew Al Gore when he was a freshman senator, and in 1987, he gave me the study papers, the white papers on this thing called the information highway, it was the internet. When I read that, that totally changed my life. I knew it was gonna happen. I knew, I, I would have quit on expeditions in 1990, because just doing it for adventure and personal didn't make any sense to me, but the, the internet. So I knew about the internet, I knew how things were gonna go. So in 1988, uh, that was part of my design. So this building is totally wired to the hilt with that. And it's very possible to build, to bring the leaders, whatever you're doing, physics, astronomy, or home ec, or however, and interact with that on, on the internet. That's, that's the real gift, because you, you can actually center that out of there. And on, the internet is gonna play a, yeah, it's a real key role, because that way, that's the way, you, of course, how you share and interact with the world by doing conferences like that. So. Thanks for that question. One last one here, and we'll. Yes. Oh, Raj. Kindle in this book. It was written by you, but then it was in guided by simplicity. That sounds like a paradox, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. The word simplicity. Yeah, simplicity. Thanks, Raj. Roger and I, by the way, were, we wrestled together in college. Uh, Raj was a senior. Raj, I wrestled for seven years. Raj was, and I was a freshman. Raj was my coach. He taught me. And in 63, when we were, we both took the uh, uh, state championship, and uh, Roger's a national champion. He went on to coach wrestling all his life at Burnsville, and we've been very close to that. But that question on simplicity, um, when I'm designing in my ideas, if these ideas get too complicated, you know, it gets more than three, you know, you know, you have these books of seven things of doing whatever, of changing your life, you know, when it gets beyond the two, <laughs> even if all seven have D or the letter, whatever it is after it, uh, you lost me on that. I'm, I see life a lot differently, but in ideas and designs, if things get too complicated, I back down. I take on very complicated projects. That's a paradise in my life, paradox. I live a simple life. Uh, and it's because I've lived a simple life that I've been able to do what I do. Because in my personal life, I fund myself very easily. But the complexity of the organization, of course, is anything but simple. But it is keeping a simple plan and always striving for simplicity is, uh, is really what, for some reason, I was born that way. Uh, I want, you know, and it was actually very practical because I worked in the factories, um, I drove cabs, to, I worked my way through high school and college, and you know, I did not want a job like that. I did not want a job, and I, and I was thankful to have that job, uh, but I, you know, everybody wanted a job. I, you know, I didn't want a job, I wanted to work on myself. But I realized as a young kid, if I kept my life simple, 
and didn't, didn't drive the new cars and go in that way, I could do the things I wanted to do. But if I got into the materials, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be leaving this country here, leaving the city. So I've always maintained uh, the simple life, uh, which has been really good for me. Okay, John and I are gonna be signing books in the back. Um, stick around as long as they'll keep us here. I wanna thank everybody for coming tonight. Thank you.